Hi everybody, welcome to my backyard. Um, it's been a while since I made a video and I've been having some technical difficulties. Um, I've had to switch cameras, I was having trouble with audio, I went out and did a video yesterday and wound up having to scrap the whole thing. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm going to be getting a microphone that'll hopefully clear up my audio problem that I've been having. Um, so hopefully this one goes off okay today without a hitch. But we are in Genesis chapter 39 today. And 38, if you remember, 38 was the last one which had to do with Judah and Tamar. It was off of the main storyline, kind of. So 39 picks up where 37 left off. And where 37 left off is Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery in Egypt. So now this picks up the story of Joseph in Egypt. All right. In verse 1, we see, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down hither. Now, these Ishmaelites that brought him there, I think it was the same group, maybe. They called them Midianites, and they called them Ishmaelites. And I had said how maybe they were two different groups. Actually, I think they were the same group. Um, but Potiphar bought Joseph from these Ishmaelite traders, which brought him there. And the Lord was with Joseph. Now, the word used here for Lord is L-O-R-D in all capitals. Whenever that's used in the King James Bible, that is actually the proper name of God, which is transliterated in English, capital Y-H-W-H. -H. There's actually no vowels in it, and uh, it's unclear of the actual pronunciation. Uh, some people say Yahweh. Uh, in years past, they said Jehovah. Uh, the Jews said uh, Yehovah, but there are several different ways of pronouncing the name, but that's, that's what it is, and what it means is the existing one, the one who is, the existing one, I am that I am, that's what that means, but it says the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, Joseph even though he was a prisoner. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. It says here that Joseph was prosperous. But he was a servant of Potiphar. Now, the prosperity here uh, doesn't necessarily mean money. It means that he was successful in, in everything that the Lord had him do. Verse 3, And his master saw that the Lord was with him. Now, once again, that's capital L-O-R-D. So, his master saw that this, this was Joseph's God. It was Yehovah that was with Joseph. And Potiphar knew this. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass, from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. So this is just, just showing how the Lord, if you were in God's will, the Lord will bless you in whatever situation you're in. I've experienced this in my life. When, you know, my situation, I, I spent some time in prison and when I was there, 
I wasn't there for doing good. You know, I wasn't unjustly arrested or anything like that. I was there for things that I did for DUIs is why I was there. Uh, you can go back and listen to my testimony if you want. It's kind of a long video. It's over an hour long, but I go into detail about everything that happened. And God was with me. He had his hand on my life <laughs> through the whole thing. And these fantastic things happened when I was in there. And I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I would have to say now that that happening and the Lord sending me to prison like that is the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> it really is. Because when I came out, I was totally transformed. But we're seeing here that Joseph is in captivity. But he's put in charge He's put in charge of the captain of the guard's house because favor was with him and he was good at everything that he put his hand to. And in verse 6 it says that he left all that he had in Joseph's hand and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat and Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. So he didn't even know what his finances were or anything. He let Joseph take care of the whole thing. Joseph was like steward over, over his money, his house, over everything. And he trusted Joseph to take care of this, and he did a good job. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. <laughs> okay. Now, in the story, it never says what her name is. She's just known to history as Potiphar's wife. She was an unfaithful wife. Uh, this shows you here that, that Joseph was good-looking, obviously. Uh, he was 17 when he was sold into slavery. So by, by this time, you know, they took him to Egypt and sold him to Potiphar. So I imagine he's probably at least 18 years old at this point. Now, he's probably been been there for at least a year, I would think, when this happened. But, uh, yeah. So she was coming on to Joseph, and, and she, she wanted him. And I'm sure this is when her husband was gone, you know. And notice how, whenever God is blessing you, and things are going well, that's the time that Satan will move in and he'll attack. When everything is going well in your life, God is blessing you, everything's going according to, to his will, and you think everything is, is going to turn out good, at that time is when something comes up usually. There's some kind of problem. Now, you know, when those things happen, we need to move right through that problem. We don't want to avoid it. We will just want to move right through it, keep doing what God wants us to do, and we'll see it through to the other side. Um, but that's what happened. Everything was going well with him, so then the enemy came at him, and it came through Potiphar's wife. Verse 8, it says, But he refused... Well, of course, he was a godly young man. He refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Right. So this is what he tells her. Um, obviously, you know, he was a good-looking guy. We know that because she was after him. She was obviously very beautiful too. Because otherwise she wouldn't have been uh, she wouldn't have been any type of temptation or anything to Joseph. And I'm sure that it that it was a temptation. But he, he passed the test. But if she, was, uh, if she was undesirable or ugly, I don't believe that 
Satan would have even used her. He would have found some other method to, to trip him up. So she must have been a very beautiful woman also. But in verse 10 then it says, And it came to pass, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, flirting with him and stuff, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. He wouldn't give in. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there with him. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So there was nobody there but just the two of them. And he didn't want anything to do with it. She grabbed his, his garment and he ran out of it. You know, it was probably some type of a robe or something. Or a shirt, maybe. It just says garment. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them. She's going to establish this lie now. She spake unto them, saying, See, he, talking about her husband, he hath brought in an Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass, when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. So she's establishing the story with the other servants of the house there. Because there was nobody else there. It was just her and Joseph. So she has to establish the story with other people so she has backing. Verse 16, And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. And notice how she blamed it on her husband too, to the, to the other servants. She said that uh, he brought this Hebrew unto us to mock us. <laughs> Not a good wife. Very unfaithful. Verse 17. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. <laughs> so she's telling her husband this, this lie that, that Joseph uh, tried to attack her or something, or was flirting with her. She's turning the tables. That's what she was doing, and she's saying that it was Joseph doing that to her. Um, it's wise that if you're married, or, I mean, even if you're single, in, in pretty much any situation, if you're in a situation where you're going to be alone with somebody of the opposite sex who is not your spouse, you need to try to, avo to avoid that happening, you know, or, or try and arrange it so that somebody else is there. Because when you're alone with the opposite sex, it may not be a situation like this where they try something and then, and then lie about it. It might not be that. It could be um, just perception of what other people see. It could start rumors. You know, people see you with somebody of the opposite sex alone, and they might start a rumor that there's an affair or something like that when there's not. Now, this is something that Brother Sumrall used to talk about this. He used to say that he would not allow himself to be alone with any woman member of his staff. Um, he was probably closest to his secretary. And this woman, when, when I was a kid, I remember her name, her name was Shirley, and she was a woman that went to our church. I know who she was, but when they went places together, they, sometimes if he had to go to the bank or if they were riding from the, the church to, say, the TV station to do something, uh, if he was driving, he would have her ride in the back seat. He wouldn't even let her ride in the front seat with him. 
because he didn't want it to be a, a wrong perception of anything going on or anything like that. And if at all possible, he would avoid being alone with her at all. Even though, you know, she was a Christian woman, but that's not the point. The point was is that it could cause rumors and, and give people the wrong idea. And it can cause all kinds of trouble. Verse 19. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. Well, of course, he's going to believe his wife. Certainly. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison. <laughs> you remember this guy was the captain of the guard. So I don't know how their government worked back then, but obviously he had the authority to just send him to prison. There was probably no court or anything like that. But he put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Now, now see how this is happening? It's like no matter what situation he's put into, he has a favor of God. <laughs> um, you know, he was favored with his father. Then his brothers came against him thought that you know they were going to kill him or sell him and that you know he wouldn't survive they probably thought he was dead or they thought that he was being tortured or something or in prison or they didn't know they sold him into slavery but look how it turned out good for him and then when the devil came against him through Potiphar's wife and he went to prison then he was favored there too <laughs> And the keeper of the prison, this is verse 22, committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. So he was like a trustee. Nowadays, in like say in a county jail, they call that a trustee. It's usually a prisoner that's been there for a while and they, they give them tasks to do. And, and they're, they're allowed to come out of their cell and, you know, like serve in the kitchen and do different things. It's called a trustee. Well, that's kind of like what it was. That's how it started out. And it became where he was uh, like the head of the prisoners and he took care of everything in the prison. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper this is divine favor it's it's nothing else it's not really anything to do with what joseph did other than the fact that he was obedient he loved the lord and he was obedient to the lord uh, and the lord favored him that's the end of the chapter there that's how it ends it ends where he's he's in the prison and he's in charge of the prison now and in Psalm 1, the first Psalm, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Um, I used to look at this as not being possible. But now, <laughs> I see now, it is possible. It is possible. We can, we can be in a, in a state of constant prayer with the Lord. And we can meditate on the Lord's word all the time through everything that we do. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. <laughs> that sounds like what's going on there with Joseph. Whatever he did prospered. But then it says on the other side of that coin, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, 
nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Now, when it says that they won't stand in the judgment, that doesn't mean that the wicked won't be judged. They most certainly will be judged. What that means is that they won't be able to, uh, they won't succeed in the judgment. They won't be a good judgment. They won't be able to stand in the judgment. They'll fall. They'll fall in the judgment. Verse 6, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So once again, there we go. The ungodly are going to perish. The things we see in the world now going on, <laughs> the wicked, the wicked things that are happening high up, the people that are in control and that are running things in the world, these are evil people, most of them. Um, I'm not calling out any names here, and I'm not mentioning anybody specifically. I'm just saying that the rulers of this world, people that are in prominent positions, most of them are very, very evil, wicked people. These people are actually, they're, they're Satanists, a lot of them, and they the things that happen with the, the, the human trafficking and things like that is rampant in this world. A lot of these things are going to be revealed before too long, and I think people people are going to be very shocked at the things that have happened, that have gone on, that will soon be revealed. Um, read Psalm 37. I did a video one time on Psalm 37. It talks about how the righteous will inherit the earth. The meek will inherit the earth. Jesus said in Psalm 37, the whole psalm talks about how the wicked will be no more. There will be a day that will come that they will be removed. They'll be gone. And that you'll look and you'll consider their place and you'll think, well, where'd they go? <laughs> and they're gone. Uh, Matthew 13, in the parable of the wheat and the tares, that's talked about too. How the wicked, the, the tares, the sons and daughters of the, of the wicked one, will be taken out of the field, which is the world. And then the righteous will shine forth in the kingdom of their father. So, it's just something to remember. That they are going to be removed. They aren't going to take over the earth. That's not going to happen. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, we read, And let us not be weary in well-doing. Hang in there. For in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So we need to walk circumspectly in this world. We need to do what's right. We need to uh, be kind to our fellow man, whether they're good or bad. We need to do what, what we're supposed to do. Now, of course, the Lord will lead us in a lot of situations. A lot of times, the Lord will, le will lead us to just leave somebody alone. Somebody that's, that's unwilling to submit themselves to him or to do what's right. There's some people that are just obstinate and are going the wrong way. And a lot of times the Lord just releases them. And you can feel it in your spirit whether, whether the Lord wants you to pursue them or not. Now, of course, he's not willing that any should perish and that all should come to repentance. So we need to keep that in mind, too. Uh, we, we don't want to take pleasure in somebody falling. Or if a wicked person is killed <laughs> and we know that their end is not going to be good, we don't need to rejoice in that. That's a very sad thing. The Lord doesn't rejoice in it. He's not willing that any should perish. But he wants all to come to repentance. So we need to have ears to hear and eyes to see and just to walk walk with the Lord in this wicked world that we live in now and before too long we'll be coming out the other side let's pray 
Heavenly Father, I ask that we, you would continue to give us sight and to help us to hear when you're speaking to us and to understand which way we're to go in any given situation that, that comes across our way. Lord, help us to take things that come as they come and to move through those things in the power of your name. Lord, we thank you for our salvation and we just give you all glory and all praise. Lord, I ask that you'd bless my friends and help us to move through this uh, confusing landscape that the world is now. We give you all the glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, I will see you next time around. I love you all. Bye-bye. That is just the reason I tell it now.